This is Duke University. So good evening, my name is Ian Bauckham. I'm the director of the Franklin Humanities Institute and it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to um, this year's annual distinguished lecture in the humanities and in particular to welcome our speaker, Rob Nixon, the Rachel Carson Professor of English at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Rob, it's absolutely wonderful to have you here. Um, this is the 10th year um, that the Franklin Humanities Institute has organized this lecture, um, whose purpose is to invite a leading writer uh, or artist or scholar in the humanities to Duke to, and to ask them to address a question that cuts across the humanities disciplines um, and while engaging questions that emerge from study, simultaneously engages a fundamental question attending to the university's purpose and core mission across its many schools, institutes, and initiatives. Uh, in previous years, our speakers have included, most recently, Joan Scott, um, and before her, Salman Rushdie, Komi Baba, Pauline Yu, Anthony Apia, Isaac Julian, Mika Ball, Ramila Thapar, and Emery Elliott. Um, Rob, it's an honor to welcome you to that very distinguished um, company of speakers. Um, I'm particularly pleased that Rob is joining us this evening as a guest both of the Franklin Humanities Institute and of the Nicholas School of the Environment, uh, the co-sponsor for this year's talk. And I'd like to thank Dean Bill Chimides. I don't know if Bill is here yet. Um, I know that he will be joining us. Um, Dean Bill Chimides, the Dean of the Nicholas School, and my colleague Erica Weinthal from, uh, from Nicholas. Um, thank you very much for your sponsorship and for making this occasion possible for us. Um, we particularly welcome the co-sponsorship with the Nicholas School for two reasons. Um, the first is that the purpose of these lectures is simultaneously to hear from scholars deeply versed within their disciplinary fields, leading figures within those fields, but who in their animation of the central questions of those disciplinary domains are simultaneously speaking across that transdisciplinary form of knowledge and scholarly engagement upon which the university prides itself and that is so central to the work both of our institute uh, and the work of education at the undergraduate and graduate levels at Duke. Um, and um, because I can imagine no scholar, um, really quite frankly, better equipped to speak about the intersections of literary study um, and the challenges that environmental degradation, climate crisis, threats to biodiversity, um, pollution, and are thinking about our being within history um, as environmental um, beings within history. I can think of no one better than Rob Nixon um, to address those issues with us tonight. Um, I also cannot imagine anyone more perfectly equipped to offer Rob a proper introduction uh, than my good friend uh, and colleague Erica Weinthal, uh, professor from the Nicholas School, a co-director uh, of the Border Works Laboratory at the Franklin Humanities Institute, um, and a um, key co-organizer of all of these events. So I'm going to turn the podium over to Erica to introduce Rob, and then we'll hear from him. Thank you again for joining us. So Ian, thank you for that generous introduction. And before I introduce um, Rob Nixon tonight, I first also want to express my appreciation to the Franklin Humanities Institute, and especially to Ian for inviting the Nicholas School of the Environment to co-sponsor this year's distinguished lecture. Um, this lecture is just one example of the many types of collaborations currently underway between faculty and students affiliated with both the Franklin Humanities Institute and the Nicholas School of the Environment. And I only anticipate that we'll have more and more and, um, types of collaborations and they will deepen over the coming years. As such, I am deeply honored to be able to introduce this evening's speaker, Professor Rob Nixon. Professor Nixon is the Rachel Carson Professor of English at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He received his PhD from Columbia University and then taught at Columbia before moving to Wisconsin. Professor Nixon has long been recognized as a major literary figure in post-colonial studies, especially for his early work on V.S. Nepal and on South African literature and culture. His memoir, Dreambirds, marked him out as a significant scholar who also writes as a public intellectual and has a broad audience outside the academy. While Professor Nixon has accumulated many awards over his career, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, a MacArthur Foundation Peace and Security Fellowship, and a National Endowment for Humanities Fellowship, he also received the 2012 
Harold and Margaret Sprout Award from the Environmental Studies section of the International Studies Association for his recent book, Slow Violence and Environmentalism of the Poor, the topic of his talk this evening. This award is given to a book in the field of the environmental social sciences, often political scientists, that makes a contribution to both theory and interdisciplinarity. It was quite fitting that Professor Nixon received this award as he is without a doubt a pioneer and leading authority in bridging environmental studies and post-colonial literature. His work on environmentalism and environmental justice sends conventional disciplinary boundaries. This scholarship furthermore has an ability to reach and influence intellectual thought and practice across diverse disciplines, many of which are represented in the audience tonight. Thus, I cannot think of a more perfect speaker to strengthen the connective tissue between the Nicholas School of the Environment and the Franklin Humanities Institute and to help further interdisciplinary dialogue in the environmental humanities at Duke and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great enthusiasm that I turn over the podium to Professor Rob Nixon. Uh, thank you, Erica, and thank you, Ian, for that uh, extraordinarily generous pair of introductions. I can see the connective tissue. <laughs> um, and thanks to the Franklin Institute and the Nicholas School. I had a wonderful evening last night talking to some people from the Nicholas School. Um, and as you know, Wisconsin's also uh, a very dynamic institution in terms of interdisciplinary environmental work. So it's uh, always a great pleasure to uh, ex exchange ideas with uh, colleagues, particularly at Duke, which both in the humanities and environmental studies is such a world leader in terms of interdisciplinary um, innovation. Uh, so there's an epigraph to, to my talk today. I was listening to the BBC World Service uh, recently, and they were interviewing some activists. Uh, what had occurred was uh, a, a, a deforestation assault on these indigenous lands and some of the people involved in that were killed. And one of the activists who chose to go unnamed on the broadcast uh, said of uh, the, the, his comrades who had, had died, he said, those people were dead to the eye before they were killed. Those people were dead to the eye before they were killed. And that really spoke to the heart of so many of the issues I want to talk to, uh, to, talk to you about today. So in the book, Slow Violence and the Environmentalism and the Poor, I, I really started out with three uh, impulses. The first was to uh, unsettle some of the dominant assumptions about violence, what we think of as violence. The second was to bear witness to the rise of environmental justice movements in the Global South. And the third and related concern was to uh, honor the writer activists and artist activists who have sought to operate as go-betweens between the social movement and broader publics. Uh, and it's often a, a thankless job in, in many ways. I mean, uh, from martyrdom to simply being maligned um, by, by the press. But I've, I became very fascinated by these figures who uh, are the poor parole, the, the um, the go-betweens, the amplifiers of that are often otherwise dismissed as insignificant and far away. So we're used to thinking of violence as something explosive and spectacular, as erupting into concentrated visibility. But we need to think through, I think, the, the strategic and representational challenges posed by the relative invisibility of what I call slow violence, in other words, a violence that is neither spectacular nor instantaneous, but instead is incremental. It's a gradual violence. And its calamitous repercussions are postponed across a range of timescales. So what I want to do then is complicate conventional assumptions about violence as a highly bounded, eruptive act. Uh, highly visible and newsworthy because it is event-focused, targeted at a specific body or bodies, and bounded very clearly in time. So in thinking about the, the temporal dispersion of slow violence, uh, th this may impact the way we perceive uh, and respond to a number of, of social crises, including uh, 
domestic abuse, uh, post-traumatic stress, but for the purposes of today's talk, I'm going to focus on specifically on environmental justice implications. So a major challenge facing us as environmentalists is how to create stories and images that can capture the slow catastrophes of delayed effects. Now, this is an image from the 1940s, um, and it was put out by a pesticides corporation that was trying to promote DDT. There was a stockpile of DDT after World War II. Uh, and what you, this is a, a, an image of the toxic sublime. They had got this model in evident, robust, good health, and surrounded her with a cloud of DDT, supplied her with a root beer and a hot dog uh, to demonstrate the evident safety of, of their product. Okay, so it's a kind of a, a nimbus of uh, DDT that she's floating uh, on in this context. Okay, so th there are many in such instances where um, industry, government, and so forth have tried to um, shrink the time frame of the hazard. Not always as crudely as that. Uh, think of the following examples of, of uh, slow violence, climate change, the thawing cryosphere, the slow toxic drift of agricultural nitrates down the Mississippi, creating a dead zone larger than New Jersey and the Gulf. If we think of oil spills, deforestation, acidifying ocean, biomagnification, all of these are slow unfolding disasters. And they all uh, present formidable representational and, and organizational challenges that can hinder our efforts to create stories and images around which to mobilize. Crucially, slow violence is, not, uh, is often not just accumulative, but exponential. In other words, uh, it operates as a major threat multiplier. And I know Erica and others have, have worked on these, these issues of, um, uh, of, of um, the exponential effects of, of resource bottlenecks that uh, erupt from slow violence. Different types of disaster are granted unequal coverage in our media-driven world. Falling bodies, this is not quite working, sorry. Falling bodies, burning towers, exploding heads, avalanches, volcanoes, tsunamis. They all have a visceral page-turning potencies the tales of slow violence that unfurl over months, years, decades, even centuries, uh, cannot match. So these stories of toxic buildup, massing greenhouse gases, accelerated species loss, may all be cataclysmic, but they're scientifically convoluted cataclysm, uh, and in which the casualties are postponed, often for generations. So a crucial question is this. In an age when the media reveres spectacle and when public policy is shaped primarily around a perceived immediate need, how in these circumstances can we convert image and narrative, uh, can co convert into image and narrative disasters that are slow moving and long in the making? Disasters that are anonymous and celebrity deficient? Disasters that are gradual and indifferent, of indifferent interest to the sensation-driven technologies of our media world? How, in other words, can we turn the long emergencies of slow violence into stories dramatic enough to rouse public opinion and warrant political intervention? Okay. So that's a contrast between the Deepwater Horizon explosion and the Corexit enfolded into the wave action in the Gulf. Uh, we've just seen the 50th anniversary of Rachel Carson's uh, Silent Spring. And to talk about these matters is to address a subject that she touched on, which is what she called death by indirection. Death by indirection. I think it's a very resonant phrase because it suggests uh, oblique death, ricochet death, but also sometimes uh, beneath the idea of indirection, direction itself, okay? Uh, 
And her, her particular topics uh, that were central to her writing were toxic drift and biomagnification. And she remarked how these processes were formless and obscure. And as a literary critic, uh, this was something that particularly interested me in her writing approach. Uh, the, the way she was trying to find forms, be it elegy, apocalypse, pastoral, or whatever, find forms for the formless and try to give um, a bodily presence to the, the oblique and the dispersed. So I want to ground my thinking on slow violence with a few specific examples. Um, one, one obvious uh, case is, is that of wars uh, whose lethal repercussions uh, are, are typically tidily bookended, but, seldom, uh, but that's seldom the end to the casualty count. In a recent editorial uh, in the New York Times, they mentioned, quote, uh, during our dozen years in Vietnam, the U.S. killed 1.5 million people, unquote. But that simple word during shrinks the toll. Hundreds of thousands of people survived the war years only to lose their lives prematurely to Agent Orange. Uh, so we, 30, more than 30 years after the last Agent Orange spraying run, we're having two processes that are unfolding. The unfolding of the scientific recognition that there are now 17 fatal conditions that are exacerbated by heightened exposure to Agent Orange. And secondly, the staggered effects across uh, generations, in other words, the genetic um, um, carryover of that. Um, in fact, just I think just three years ago, the US Institute of Medicine added Parkinson's disease and ischemic heart disease to uh, fatal conditions that uh, were, were linked directly to Agent Orange. So we can see in a case like this, the word during, and this is a very typical way of historicizing war, during uh, automatically shrinks uh, the, the, the toll. And so what I'm interested in is, is, is the kind of contrail of slow violence, uh, finding other ways of thinking and telling the stories about uh, a kind of violence that exceeds the, that kind of bracketing. Slow violence casualties are, are hidden from view even more dramatically when we turn to the era of depleted uranium munitions, uh, which were first deployed in the 1990 uh, Gulf War. Depleted uranium possesses a, a durability almost beyond our comprehension. It has a radioactive half-life of 4.51 billion years. When it enters the environment, depleted uranium effectively does so at all, for all time. And there has been, from within the Pentagon and, and, and various components of the US uh, military world, uh, quite considerable commentary on this issue. And I just wanted to uh, read one of these. Colonel James Norton uh, talking on the long-term risk. We feel we have to use depleted uranium. It's radioactive. I wish it wasn't, but I can't change the laws of physics. The issue is once you've had a hit, once you've been involved in the catastrophic failure of the tank, did the crew survive long enough to really care whether it was tungsten, a less lethal alternative, or depleted uranium that hit them? Anyone who does should count themselves damn lucky. I'm sure every soldier would thank God that he lived 40 years to contract lymphoma. So this is a, a, quite a, a blunt uh, acknowledgement that Heat of battle lethality trumps um, the, 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 the violence of deferred effects. So in our age of depleted uranium warfare, <clears throat> we have an ethical obligation to challenge the military body counts that consistently underestimate the true toll of waging such high-tech wars. And the underestimation um, is, is typically there in the advance planning and in the retrospect, retrospective counting. Who is counting the staggered deaths that civilians and soldiers suffer from ingested depleted uranium? Who is counting the belated fatalities from unexploded cluster bombs that over time morph into uh, landmines and lying in wait for months or years? Who's counting the deaths from chemical residues mined by so-called pinpoint bombing 
uh, residues that turn into foreign insurgents, infiltrating native rivers and poisoning the food chain. Who is counting the victims of genetic deterioration, the stillborn malformed infants uh, whose parents' uh, DNA had been scrambled by war's toxins? And we see these clusters of this in Basra and Fallujah in particular. The calculus of any conflict needs to incorporate such environmental casualties. They may suffer slow, invisible deaths that don't fit the cycle of CNN or Fox News, but they are war casualties nonetheless. I want to turn now to a second example, a different kind of, uh, of struggle against slow violence. And this is evidenced by the uh, Kenyan uh, Greenbelt movement that some of you may know of, uh, led by Wangari Maathai, who in 2005 was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize together with her movement. And basically under the authoritarian Arab Moy uh, regime in Kenya, uh, there was massive deforestation going on and uh, resultant soil erosion. So what uh, Wangari Maathai and several other women uh, did was one, I think 1977, on, uh, they, they decided to form a movement among poor women across the nation to plant trees, to, for, for afforestation, in other words, to, to re-green the nation. And uh, they were assaulted uh, with knees, um, they would arrive armed with saplings and, and meet with whips and machetes and guns. Uh, but they, in the end, they, they, they planted something like 100 million trees across Kenya and uh, across adjoining nations. And so it, it has been actually a, a real inspiration for these environmental justice movements across the world. And I, I, wherever I travel, I often see her invoked. Um, in thinking about this in her memoir, uh, Wangari Maathai wrote this, the following. During the rainy season, thousands of tons of topsoil are eroded from Kenya's countryside by rivers and washed into the ocean and lakes. Additionally, soil is lost through wind erosion in areas where the land is devoid of vegetative cover. Losing topsoil should be considered analogous to losing territory to an invading enemy. Indeed, if any country were so threatened, it would mobilize all available resources, including a heavily armed military, to protect the priceless land. Unfortunately, the loss of soil through these elements has yet to be perceived with such urgency. So what's unusual and what's productive, I think, about her reformulation of security here is uh, Wangari Maathai's insistence that national territorial integrity be expanded to include threats to the nations uh, from in environmental assault. Okay. So it, the way of reframing, and, uh, reframe, by reframing violence in this way, uh, she's changing the language of national uh, defense. In this context, um, there's a very powerful image from Banksy's uh, Bethlehem series, which I think resonates with exactly these themes. What, he, what he's talking about, uh, or what he's, what he's gesturing towards imaginatively, is the, a certain kind of invisible dismemberment. Uh, and it's a very particular kind of dismemberment, which is the uh, decapitation, uh, a mindless uh, deforestation, uh, uh, pulling down of trees that I think is beautifully uh, conveyed in this way and speaks to precisely the kind of interests that uh, Wangari Maathai is articulating. So I think it's helpful here to, to situate slow violence in terms of changes in the way that we now inhabit time. Ours is an onrushing age of digital capitalism where the present feels more abbreviated than it used to at least for the privileged classes who live surrounded by technological time savers, which ironically often leave us feeling time poor. Consequently, one of the most pressing challenges of our age is how to adjust our rapidly eroding uh, attentions to the slow erosions of environmental justice. If under neoliberalism, the gulf between the enclaved rich and the outcast poor is widening, <coughs> 
Ours is also an era of enclave time, where speed has become a self-justifying propulsive ethic and a, a kind of ethic of speed that renders so-called uneventful violence a weak claimant on our time. So in an age of degraded attention spans, it now becomes doubly urgent to focus on the toll exacted over time by the slow violence of ecological degradation. Another way of, of approaching this is uh, through, through Cory Doctorow's perception that we live in a, in a, in a time of, uh, uh, where the electronic screen has become an ecosystem of interruption technologies. Or as former Microsoft executive Linda Stone puts it, we live in a state of continuous partial attention. Fast is faster than it used to be, and story units have become concomitantly shorter. So to make slow violence visible entails redefining speed. We see such efforts in talk of accelerated species loss and the reconfiguring of the world word glacial, which used to mean uh, unacceptably slow, and now has become a trope for unacceptably rapid loss. So what does it take in an age of fractured attention spans to representatively the signs of long-term damage? I want to turn to another example now, which is that of the Maldives, uh, islands in the uh, Indian Ocean, very small islands, population perhaps 350,000 people. And this was at the time of the tsunami and uh, the breaching of the seawall. Like many of these islands, uh, the, the atolls in the Maldives were suffering as a result of the warming oceans and the dying off of the coral reefs. So the natural barriers uh, were, were not functioning as they used to, and the seawall was, was erected uh, with limited success. And so what we have here is an image of, uh, of a sea change that is indissociably climatic and societal. And the Maldives are significant because they're one of two nations that are projected to be the first uh, entire nation to become climate change refugees. Uh, and so they're, they're, what they're trying to adjust to is the, the, the foreshadowing uh, what, what, they, what, what their migration, the, their projected migration does, is it foreshadows the wider crisis of human displacement that is linked to the temporal displacements that I've been outlining today. You may have come across this image of the Maldivian uh, President Mohammed Nasheed, this was just before the uh, 2009 climate summit in Copenhagen, okay? And he's holding a cabinet meeting, uh, well oxygenated cabinet meeting, uh, and signing into law a, a commitment to being carbon neutral within 10 years, okay? So you can see what, how a a nation like the Maldives suffers from a, a double kind of invisibility. First of all, it's small and remote, and hardly anybody in the nations that are the primary uh, um, consumers of carbon products are, um, are aware of the Maldives. But it's invisible in the second way, way that uh, the, the calamity, the emergency of the long term that is absolutely central to Maldivian identity uh, is, so, is, an, is an infinitely deferrable uh, emergency in terms of, of the political priorities uh, in the West. So what uh, President um, Nasheed de decided to, to do then was to try to dramatize this emergency through the subaqueous theater uh, so, so using a performance, put in, in, infusing a performance element and a tone of both elegy and humor to the arena. It was picked up by 350.org and, and went viral in, 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 in a lot of ways. So it became, the, the issue became internationalized. So it, this, I read this as a premonitory underwater landscape that is a preview of the aftermath. Uh, it's an attempt to accelerate and compress time uh, 
and to uh, speak out in its way against wasted foreknowledge. There's a second way that I read this, um, this uh, particular scene. I read it as, a, as an image of reverse inundation. Um, now, over time, we've become very accustomed to the language of inundation, swamping, drowning, uh, in relation to migration narratives. Um, particularly uh, in, in, whether in Germany or, or US or UK or elsewhere. Uh, this, it's a standard rhetoric. Uh, and this is just one classic literary case um, from The Great Gatsby. Civilization's going to pieces. I've gotten to be a terrible pessimist about things. Have you read The Rise of the Colored Empires by this man, Goddard? The idea is if we don't look out for the white race, we'll, we'll be utterly submerged. Okay. So what I see here is, is a reversal of that storyline. So basically, uh, the, the, the brown and black people in the global south uh, are in the front lines of a reverse inundation, uh, the results, the, the delayed consequences of a 200 plus year experiment in carbon uh, extraction and consumption, the primary beneficiaries of which have been in the rich white nations of the world. So I'm interested here in the flag in the background, the Maldivian flag. We're, we're accustomed to flags as uh, things that are placed on summits. Uh, so this is, again, a, re a reversal of that. In the, in the case of Maldives, the highest point is seven feet. It's about Yaman. So uh, there's, there's not a lot of summit to put it on in the first place. Uh, but the idea is of an involuntary conquest uh, imposed upon the society. And I cannot observe this submerged flag with thinking of a second submerged flag which uh, appeared at almost simultaneously in, on the Arctic uh, seabed. Just around this time, a Russian submarine descended to the seabed beneath the North Pole and planted a Russian flag. This flag planting marked a very different, less ironic oceanic land grab. Denmark immediately disputed the Kremlin's claim to the Arctic continental shelf, so did Canada. The Russian expedition leader, Arta Chilengorov, declared, quote, unquote, the Arctic is Russia dispatched troop reinforcements to the uh, Arctic edge. Canada declared it would follow suit and was going to build an Arctic port city. The US, Norway, EU uh, all climbed into this controversy with claims of their own. So global warming was the trigger for this militant rhetoric and these troop movements. The Meltic Arctic pack ice had opened the prospect of new sea lanes, as we now know, exposing hitherto unexplored deposits, hitherto inaccessible deposits, uh, particularly of, of gas and oil. So we face the prospect of expanded suboceanic carbon reserves being extracted and burnt, courtesy of global warming. Accelerated the very, accelerating the very processes of slow violence that will drown the Maldives first, but which, unchecked, will ultimately breach the walls that concretize a planetary delusion. The delusion that long-term we can segregate uh, orderly societies from disorderly ones, secure societies from insecure ones, uh, those uh, that remain safe from these long-term fallouts, uh, segregated from those that are abandoned to destitution and climate chaos. So from the, from the perspective of climatic slow violence, the so-called Arctic carbon bonanza gives a whole new meaning to the race to the bottom. These two um, are then, in a sense, carbon copies of each other. The scenes remind us that the climate crisis, while ultimately indivisible, remains unevenly felt, experienced above all, first and foremost, by some of the uh, planet's most vulnerable people as climate injustice. The seabed scene in the Arctic serves as a starting gun for the 21st century scramble by global behemoths to colonize even more of the Earth's resources. 
while the other submerged scene in the Maldives gives a whole new ecological twist to the anti-colonial phrase, the development of underdevelopment. Edward Said wrote of what he called the normalized quiet of unseen power, the normalized quiet of unseen power. This normalized quiet is of particular relevance, I think, to the, to the hushed havoc and the injurious invisibility that slow violence generates. It's the poor and above all the impoverished populations of the global south who inhabit the front lines of slow violence. The invisibility of their poverty is exacerbated by the invisibility of the processes, the, the extended processes of slow violence that permeate so many of their lives. So there's this conjoined invisibility of poverty and uh, attenuated violence. Our temporal towards spectacular instantaneous violence increases the vulnerability of ecosystems treated as disposable by an onrushing capitalism, while simultaneously exacerbating the vulnerability of those whom Kevin Bale has called disposable people. So it's against this combined ecological and human disposability that we have witnessed recently, particularly in, in the 21st century, a resurgent environmentalism of the poor across the so-called global south. I want to end with this image. Um, I was in the west of Ireland a couple of summers ago. And uh, there's a struggle in this particular uh, historically very poor part of the west of Ireland called Rossport over Shell, which was uh, mining gas there. And there were gas spillages occurring over farmland uh, and in this very precarious, sensitive estuary. And I had been working on the, the case of uh, Shell and uh, the Nigerian regime in the Niger Delta. And as many of you know, uh, the, the writer Ken Sarawiwa was one of nine uh, leaders of that movement opposing uh, the despoilation of the Agoni lands in the Niger Delta. He was one of the leaders of that movement and executed in 1995. Okay. What really astonished me on arriving in, in this part of Ireland was to see a huge mural of Ken Sarawiwa. Um, and that's the name of the Agoni eight, the other eight, uh, the other executed Nigerians uh, who were executed for their protest. And that's one of his poems translated into Gaelic. Uh, and so it was one of those surprising, those, those surprising moments of transnational connection where Estuary people, this is a, an ancient fishing village in Ireland, uh, recognized some vulnerabilities and some forms of resistance coming from a delta people who were also very, very dependent on the qualities of the water, on the movements of, uh, of, of, the, of the tides, and uh, reached out and, and created both imaginatively and politically the, these links uh, across uh, that struggle. Thank you very much. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.